In this video, we're um, going to be talking about two mean value theorems. So one is the sort of known version of the mean value theorem, and the second one is a more general version of the mean value theorem. Um, this video is not related to um, the series on the principle, uh, the work energy principle. Um, it's kind of just like a standalone video. So uh, some prior knowledge of things will, will need to be assumed in watching this video. So the first theorem we're going to be talking about is something called uh, the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem. And I think sometimes it's uh, it, the theorem's name is attributed to Lagrange. So Lagrange's mean value theorem. And it states that if you have a function um, on a closed interval a b to r and uh, let's say f is continuous on a b and um, differentiable but not necessarily at the endpoints so on the open interval a b then there exists a point C in AB such that F prime of C equals F of B minus F of A over B minus A. So graphically what this means is if you have a continuous function, if you have a differentiable function on an interval that is continuous at the endpoints, so something maybe like like this, okay, and you take the secant line connecting the endpoints then at some point between A and B over here there will be another point which looks to be somewhere about here where the tangent the tangent line to that point is parallel to uh, the secant line to these two points now this is quite uh, an intuitive theorem because if you imagine this graph over here as the um, position as the position of I don't know a car moving in a straight line or just a particle moving in a straight line at any given time then its first derivative or or the steepness of this graph of position uh, on the y-axis uh, versus time is really just uh, the speed at which the particle is traveling. And so this, the gradient of the secant line uh, represents the average, the average speed. Now, because this function is, you know, we're moving continuously from some initial speed to some final speed, uh, we ought to expect at some point our instantaneous speed to be exactly equal to our average speed. Because intuitively, if all of our uh, instantaneous speeds at every single point, um, you know, was that, if, if it was either always above the average speed or always below the average speed, we would have a problem. And the thing is, speeds, uh, speeds work smoothly in a sense. So what I mean by that is, if at some point we were below the average speed, so let's say this was a line which represents average speed, at some point instantaneously if we were below the average speed, and then at a later point if we were above, because of the nature of how speed is defined and how it works, we would, re we would reach a contradiction. We, we would have to go through that average speed line. So if at no point during our motion, we we uh, are traveling with instantaneous speed equal to our average speed. 
it must imply that our instantaneous speeds were either always above the average speed line or always below the average speed line. And then we'd reach another contradiction because our average speed line can't be above all our data points and it certainly intuitively can't be um, below all our data points. Otherwise it wouldn't be the average speed. Okay. So intuitively that makes sense and also if you were to think of an average in the, in the discrete sense of a couple of numbers like you took a, a sample mean so something like this and you call it let's say x bar then you know you can't have there there, there has there have to be some data points that um, are either uh, below or above the uh, the sample mean. Um, if all data points were above the sample mean, uh, then you would have a contradiction. If all data points were below the sample mean, you would have a contradiction. Um, so, in other words, the sample mean, you know, has got to be somewhere between data points. So some data points got to be have to be below the sample mean, and some data points have to be above the sample mean. You can't have all data points on on one end of of the sample mean, otherwise you you reach a contradiction. You wouldn't be a sample mean. Okay, so it's a very intuitive theorem, and the proof of this theorem is pretty standard. Um, what we do is we basically take advantage of the fact that we're uh, dealing with a continuous function. So we can apply another theorem basically called uh, Rolle's theorem uh, which which just states that if you have a function and at endpoints where the function is defined, so let's say the function maps a closed interval a, b to r at the function's endpoints where it's defined, um, you know, there, f of a is equal to f of b and f is continuous, so f is continuous on uh, a b, differentiable on the open interval a b, and um, well, what Rolle's theorem basically says is there has to exist some point in between a and b where we have a zero gradient. Um, so essentially, very intuitively speaking, what comes up must go down. So if we have roots, for instance, and we're continuous, we're going up, we've got to come down at some point, which means you know we must peak at some point, or if we're going down, we have to come up. We'll we'll peak at some point and that and at that point we'll we'll get a we'll definitely get a zero gradient. Okay. Now Rolle's theorem though just says there exists one point. Uh, there may exist many points between A and B. Um, really depends whether a and b is a minimal or a maximal interval. Uh, so if a and b is the smallest interval that guarantees this, uh, then you know by definition you just can't have two points there because then I can easily just construct another interval which guarantees it. If it's the smallest interval that guarantees it, yeah, you'll find just one um, maximum or minimum. If it's not the smallest interval, that guarantees it. Uh, you, you may you may be able to find a bunch of different uh, maximums and minimums between a and b. Okay, so the actual proof of the mean value theorem will exploit Rolle's theorem. What we do is we construct the following function. We consider f of x plus a of x, where a is some constant at the moment. We're not sure what it is. And we want to be able to apply Rolle's theorem. Now, Rolle's theorem requires the assumption that h of a equals h of b. Okay, and you know this is clearly a continuous function. This is a linear function. This is continuous. So this is a continuous function. Well, for h of a to equal h of b, f of a plus a into little a must equal f of b plus a into little b. And so using this, we can actually work out what our constant should be if we're trying to construct a function h where we can exploit Rolle's theorem. So we get our constant as, well, the 
1 minus, sorry, not 1 minus, negative 1 times the average gradient. Okay. All right, which means that at some point, f prime of, you know, h prime of c, Uh, we should be able to get 0, which means at some point f prime of c equals minus a, which is just the average gradient. So that's the proof of uh, Lagrange, uh, Lagrange's mean value theorem. Now there's a more generalized mean value theorem, which I'll quickly state, which is also very useful and uh, is useful especially in the proof of uh, L'Hopital's rule, which is very important. So the more generalized version of the mean value theorem is, I think, uh, I believe is attributed to Cauchy, and it states that if you have f and g with the same conditions um, previously stated, with g of b not equal to g of a, then there exists a point between a and b such that uh, the derivative of f divided by the derivative of g at the same point is actually equal to a sort of a sort of average gradient. You can kind of think of this as like the the average gradient of the first function divided by the average gradient of the second function, so the quotient. Uh, of the average gradients, okay? And this is neat, and the proof is also quite neat, so take again, construct a function h of x and call it f of x plus some constant into g of x, and we want to make h of x so that we can apply Rolle's theorem again, so that this is true, and we get our constant to just be f of b minus f of a over g of b minus g of a times negative 1. So there has to be a point c in between a and b such that f prime of c plus a into g prime of c is actually equal to uh, 0. Which means that f prime of c equals, well, what's minus a? Minus a is just this quotient f of b minus f of a over g of b minus g of a g prime of c. Now, dividing both sides by g prime of c, we get the desired result. It's not immediately obvious, though, why we can divide both sides by g prime of c, but you see that using the condition we stated, it's actually impossible for g prime of c to be zero, because if g prime um, if c was zero at any point, uh, if, if if there if there was even one point where g prime of c um, was zero, uh, this would be contradictory. Or rather, sorry, uh, forget forget what I said. Um, the reason we can actually divide g prime of c uh, is because we should act. We should have actually assumed that the first derivative is never zero in this interval. g prime of c is never in zero for all c in this interval. Okay. So using that we can divide by g prime of c and that also justifies that you know g g b minus g a can't be zero. Okay, because I realized the what I said isn't true. You could easily just construct a function that looks something like that. So clearly the endpoints are not the same, but you know we have points where g prime of c is zero. So you can't you can't do that. You need to assume that g prime of c is not zero in, in those endpoints. But yeah, that's that's the main idea. That's that's the general idea of Cauchy's mean value theorem. And it turns out to be incredibly useful in proving things like L'Hopital's rule, which I think I'll be able to do in uh, in the next video. Thanks for watching.